All right, so I'll go ahead and get started with this. Um, so my name's Andy. I work at uh, Foundries IO, and one of the big focuses that I've had is looking at our company's OTA update solution. Um, so I, I want to talk about the project that we're using, um, and maybe kind of get some of you guys excited and engage with the same community. And I'm kind of hoping maybe we can make this kind of a the standard way that people are doing updates in the embedded development community. So. If you're here, I'm guessing you probably spent 30 of your life or so walking to your closet, grabbing an SD card off your dev board, taking it back to your desktop, trying to DD it. Then the USB bus or something's wrong in your laptop with your SD card reader. So you do like an anger reboot. You finally get it back up. Then you DD it. It takes forever. Go back to your closet, throw the SD card in your board and then you stare at the serial console and you hope that's the last time you have to do it for the day. And I've worked on some more advanced boards that have maybe a jumper setting that puts the board into uh, fast boot mode, but then you're still running some slow copy over and over, and it's just kind of a bad way to live. So I think there's a better way to live, and I'm gonna talk to you about how we're doing things at our company right now that are making our lives better. So first, I know what I'm talking about. We always have that one slide of all your credentials. And I know what I'm talking about because I've been failing at this for a really long time. Um, for the last several years, most of my focus is on CI automation, actually. And we just need to update things all the time in CI. But what I'm starting to find is having a good update system can also just drive your CI system. And by doing that, you also have your CI system testing your update system every day. So you're kind of keeping everything in a like, nice working uh, mode. Um, and then kind of another little tangent, but I found it's kind of interesting for like CI and embedded automation. Is we, one of the big fears we've always had on all those projects that I've got listed there is we always assume that every image that came in had the potential to like brick your board, and then you're going to be out of business. And what I'm starting to see now is like, that's kind of an edge case for a lot of people. And you wind up building this thing that's really complex and it's really slow. And because of all that, it's also really error prone. So my original thinking why I chose to use an update system to do our CI testing in our company was I wasn't worried about our devices getting bricked. But I'm also kind of, maybe it's because I'm lazy, but I'm also coming around to this kind of new thinking that an OTA system has to handle rollbacks. So if we do have a bad build, we should be able to roll back and recover from it. So in a way, it also kind of helps us test something that people are going to see in the field potentially. So um, this is a little bit about update systems kind of in my mind. I think usually you're going to see like an AB partitioning uh, scheme, like at least physically. I'm not a huge fan of that. You know, it's like double the storage space and all. So I'm kind of bullish now on this thing called OS Tree, which if, if you're not familiar with it, it's almost exactly Git for file systems. The commands feel the same, and you can use one partition to, to manage that. Um, the next thing that you have to start thinking about with update systems is how you're um, delivering securely what what targets uh, your devices need to use. And it's usually something kind of GPG-ish. Now, there's also a new thing that's out. It's called the Update Framework, or TUF. And I, in my opinion, I think probably most people that look around, it's got to be the most secure update framework out there. Um, it's also an industry standard. It's not just uh, used by you know, like embedded things like this. It's also used by uh, Docker. Um, PyPI uses it. There's a bunch of people using this now. And then in the world of updates, there's kind of a third thing called Uptain, which extends tough. And I'll get along, uh, talk more about that in a bit. So at this point, I'm guessing you, you know my accent. You can tell where I'm from Texas, and maybe I don't sound that smart to you. And that's perfectly fine because we're kind of standing on the shoulders of giants on this project. So Tuff has come out of like academia. 
We have Actualizer, which is used in the automotive industry. So we have security experts, and you're also using things like Open Embedded. So there's a lot of smart guys doing this kind of stuff. And what we found looking around for the ideal update system is Actualizer plus the OTA Connect project, which I'll talk about more. They're, it's like the one open source place where they're doing all the right things. And I don't want anyone to forget that this thing is designed for cars, so you've got like serious people that know what they're doing on this. So um, I think one thing that people tend to kind of question when, when I pitch this idea of using Actualizer or this Actualizer Lite is, why don't you just use OS Tree and GPG? And that's okay, but Tough adds a lot of things that GPG doesn't ad address. Um, the biggest one is like if you ever lose your signing key, how you can rotate that out and recover from it. But there's all these other attack vectors that they've thought through. So like doing downgrade attacks or serving up stale files that are no longer good. So Tough handles all these things for you. And it's pretty easy to use if you have things deployed the right way. So I think the complexity that Tough gives you is worth it for what you get over GPG. Now, the next thing that I've been kind of pitching lately is, so Actualizer as a project is really good. And I started working with these guys. And I kind of had this idea for Actualizer Lite. And the rationale I had was that, in, in short, the way you can kind of think about Tough is it gives you a list of what they call installable targets. And Tough saying, here's what's available for you to use. Now, Uptain. It's actually kind of the same ideas that Tuff has, but it's about telling each device, you need to be this, and you need to be this. So to me, like when you kind of think about like doing like internet type scale stuff, we talk about dealing with pets versus cattle. And Uptain to me feels like you're starting to deal with pets. We're talking to each one, telling them what they need to be. And I just want to work with the fleet. And the second kind of part from Uptain is that what we started finding with everybody that's using like the OTA Connect UI, the first thing they do is click the button, always up to date. So what we're finding now is if your goal is always up to date, you can really simplify things quite a bit, and you can get rid of the complexity that uh, Uptain brings in. So once I say I, I don't want to use Uptain, people get real worried about um, like rolling out updates. Um, in OTA Connect, they call these, uh, this kind of rolling mechanism as a ca campaign is what they refer to that as. And a campaign is basically just going through and knows what all the devices are, and it keeps telling Uptain, hey, tell this next device that it needs to go to this level. Tell this device to go to this level. So it kind of rolls things out that way. What we're doing now with our project is instead of using like that one by one, each device that we have says, I'm going to take updates with this certain tag. So as we push out builds now, we'll have like, this is a pre-merge build, so you're only crazy if you want to run this. This one's been merged, but not fully QA. So we have all these tags. So we can have our devices that like, if they're CI devices, they'll take anything. But if we just want them running like, promoted builds, then they just take that tag. That's one way to do it. You know, there's other ways. Internet guys are pretty familiar with doing things through load balancers and AB rollouts and stuff like that. So it's a different way to solve the same problem. But for us, we found it's a lot more scalable way because you're not having to tell people everything. And I, I find that's really hard to scale when you're having to tell people what to do instead of just let them ask what they should do. So. By moving that out, it's allowing us to avoid several big back-end services from the OTA Connect project. Now, another thing that I tend to see is you know, people have already built their own, I'll call it secure update system. And what I'm here to tell you is you haven't done it. And if you think you have, it's just because Matthew Garrett hadn't played with your project yet. So. I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm saying we can give you, if I, I think I put two hours on the slide, we can keep him like prevented for like three hours maybe. Um, now the next part about this is the back end systems that OTA Connect provides. 
The great thing with that is that the back end is completely open sourced and it's actively maintained by here.com. Um, they're pushing to all their GitHub repos. They do their issue tracking. That's not great. They're getting better it's a community on that. They put all their Docker builds up on Docker Hub. So it's a project you can track pretty easily. They also include a Kubernetes deployment tool. Now, that tool is a little hard to use. I've written a blog about it that's uh, in the notes um, later at the end of the slide deck. And it's like a four-part blog that'll help walk you through how you can do that. I also created another tool because I was, it's really hard standing up Kubernetes clusters and tearing them down. And when you're trying to do like quick development on stuff, it, it's just wasting all my time. So I created this little small project called OTA Compose. And this is just me taking the kind of the Kubernetes logic and making it into a Docker Compose file. So now instead of like, when I do a fresh cluster in the cloud, it's gonna take me like 20 or 30 minutes. With OTA Compose, it comes up in you know, two minutes. So I think the OTA Compose is pretty handy for development and testing. Maybe if you had like a small set of devices that you know, weren't mission critical, you could also do that. Um, the part that isn't really included with OTA Connect is the security of it. So it's in there, but they don't really tell you how. You have to build some of that yourself. So again, that's something I blogged about. It's included in the end. And we've kind of come up with our own way to add the security on top of it. But if you kind of read into their code, they have some other notes on like, they have some OpenID Connect plugins and some OAuth 2 stuff. So that stuff's there as well. It just, it takes a little more work. Um, and then there's what I'll call kind of the glue pieces. And those are missing. If you use, here.com has their commercial version of this running. It's a really great service. They have some tooling that's there. So at Foundries, we kind of created our own tooling and glue pieces that help like do things that we like and do them in the way we like. For instance, like doing tags. So I, I think um, the tooling is kind of one of those kind of value add areas. But the nice thing with that is that there's still no technical lock-in on that kind of stuff. So it makes us feel good about making this decision. Now, um, I, I keep talking about tough and the uh, target. So I think the nice thing to do now is just to show you um, what tough looks like. So this is a tough targets file. I'm gonna step down so I can see this as I'm talking to you guys. But you wind up having just an array of what they call targets. And you can see in here, there's a lot of good information. The most important thing is that's a hash of your OS tree commit that you want your device to pull down. So that's where the, this file itself in tough gets signed to where you know that it's a valid file, you know the timestamp's good on it. And then you can tell a device, hey, I want to be this build 148. And it's going to know, OK, I need this OS tree hash. You can see these tags here. For this one, I'm saying this is just a QA level build. So like if you were on the promoted tag, you would just skip that and not use it. Um, hardware IDs, pretty self-explanatory. And then we have a little section up there called Docker apps. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But as you can see there, a Docker app winds up being a pointer so you can see, like, there's this shell HTTP app that I've, I've labeled there. It winds up being a pointer to here. So that's tough as well. So it's just, you know, all signed targets from top to bottom. Hold on one second. So where you guys can make fun of me for not using for using my tiling window manager. Where we were. 
So as I was showing you in that uh, targets file, there's some what we call Docker apps in there. So Actualizer has a new feature that we, uh, it's called a Docker app package manager. Um, technically speaking, Actualizer Lite and Docker apps are two independent features that are in Actualizer. A lot of times people are calling it all Actualizer Lite because I kind of upstreamed it all at once. But um, it's two things, and Docker apps themselves I think are worth talking about. So if, are you familiar with Docker Compose? That's probably a more familiar thing. So Docker apps are a more friendly way to publish Docker Compose files. They actually wind up being just a bigger YAML file that has a top section of metadata then another section, which is just raw Docker Compose, and then a third section where you talk about uh, the environment variables that you want to set for your file. So as we were doing this, it was a little wild using Docker apps, because right now it's stable. Back in January when we were looking at this, Docker apps is still kind of a new thing people aren't real familiar with. But if you look at what's going on in the Docker community right now and the commits that they're making, I'm kind of reading the tea leaves, but Docker apps is the future there. So we've gone ahead and gone with that. But interestingly enough, the way that you use the Docker apps on a board right now is you, you pull the Docker app file down through Tough, you know it's good, and then you literally render that Docker app file to a Docker Compose file and then fire it up with Docker Compose. So it's kind of a weird thing right now. There's, they're, they're making it better, but it's all familiar is, I guess, the short for that. And then, um, how is it working for us? Um, we kind of have a nice system now. We've integrated our CI, our code, our test, and we've kind of, for our own workflow, we've set up these things that we call factories. And not, we're all kind of, in a way, not getting good at OE anymore because we just make changes, get push, see what happens. It puts a build in our personal streams. We do an update at our home device. If it looks good, then we push that to like our, you know, we merge that change to master, which then goes into our pre-merge and QA streams and eventually that gets promoted. But it's kind of made a nice system where, you know, it's just this workflow of kind of more like cloudy stuff, I guess. So if you want to try this out right now, uh, you can just integrate this into your own open embedded builds, which is kind of the hard way, but it's the ultimate way you're going to do this kind of thing. Um, there's kind of an easier way right now. I, I apologize. We don't have an official release yet with, with the Actualizer Lite enabled. The next one will have it, but we do have uh, build 607, and you'll see in a second, build 606 have this. So you can just run it. and. Uh, It'll talk to our OTA server, and you can kind of get an updatable stream for your Raspberry Pi. So at this point, let me um, flip over to, to my Raspberry Pi, and I can kind of show you what this looks like a little bit and give you a better feel. That's embarrassing. I'll have to uh, delete that key soon. Yeah. Actually, uh, I'm going to fire up Docker Compose here. So I'm just running this thing with the OTA Compose project I was talking about. So I'm going to bring up the server right now. And let's make this a little bigger. Can you guys see that OK now on the bottom? It's 
So everything here is stored under this uh, Verisota directory. This is, how, this is standard actualizer uh, stuff. We have a, a config file. It's called sodatomal. It's actually a pretty small file here. Um, it's got what kind of hardware platform I'm on. Um, some of this isn't it, polling interval doesn't really matter for this. Uh, this is a repo server, so that's where it's going to go to get the uh, tough uh, information. Then we have our OS tree server, and you can see here that my package manager type is OS tree and Docker apps. And then down here is just what Docker apps I'm going to run. I've created one for the uh, presentation here. It's called TIG. It's running uh, Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana. This is some other small uh, parameters. So this is an actualizer light command. So there's like status. This tells you what I'm running at right now. So my active image is this build 606. That's the OS tree SHA there. And I have these Docker apps that are enabled. I can also do a listing. This is going to show, uh-oh. I don't think my network's talking to each other. Well, do a quick uh, debug here. All right, well, I may have to skip the uh, cool live update now since it can't see my uh, server. That stinks. Um, I'll show you some other stuff here. So there's this Docker apps directory. And in here you can start to see um, This file is the target app. So this is the custom data that you saw from above from our targets that's telling it, OK, this is the Docker app that I need you running. And this is how you find it. And all that stuff is coming from the tough target, so you know that it's a like, cryptographically sound thing to pull down. Um, and I can go down into this one app here. And I'll actually show you the Docker app file. It's kind of an interesting thing that we have here. So as I was saying, at the top, there's just a little bit of metadata in the description. When you get down into this section of the YAML, this is just Docker Compose that we all know and love. And at this point, I don't, I don't know how a lot of people are doing Docker apps. It's kind of a dirty little hack I've been finding that makes it really easy to customize a container without having to build your own container with files in it. So I'm echoing that telegraph comp file down, and then I'm starting the daemon. And then in here, this is the uh, variables that you can configure for Docker apps. I'm actually setting that telegraph.comp file as basically a giant environment variable. But what's nice with this is a lot of times with like Docker Compose and stuff, it's hard to like. Um, it's hard to publish a file where you just need a, to customize your configuration. And the answer tends to be, well, just build your own version of the container, and that's kind of a pain because now you've got, you know, this whole build and CI loop you've got to manage. So with this, it kind of hacks around that in a pretty easy way, and then that right there turns into a Docker Compose file. So it literally it's kind of it's called a render command, and then we. Uh, call Docker Compose up on that to get the containers running. Um, now, what's nice with all that is it's 
tough all the way from the top to the bottom. So you had tough for your, your target that you were going to do for your operating system. And then within that target and the custom data, it's saying, OK, here are the Docker apps I need you to run. And those are pointers in your targets also that I was showing you. And those are also you know, toughified, for lack of a better word. So you kind of have, you know, you know everything that you're running is the exact right thing on the device. So that um, really concludes all the demo and slides I had. If you guys have some questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. I know that's kind of a lot of stuff. So yeah, go ahead, Brandon. You, you can do it either way. It, it's really more, it's, it's kind of what works good for you. Um, you. You could just, yeah, you could put it, that, you could put that in your OS tree image. And like you say, the bind mounts are going to be fine. Um, it, it's actually a pretty clever way. If not all your devices are going to be wanting to run that Docker config, you might be pushing some extra data, but it's still talking bytes, so it's probably a smart way to do it. Um, one thing that we haven't thought through with this fully yet is like managing like device-specific configuration. So I can kind of show you, I have a rough concept of it that's built into, um, I don't have a file here. So, you can, you can actually include a uh, device-specific configuration in a, a docker app.toml file in this top directory. And when docker app is running inside Actualizer, it will apply those uh, custom environment variables into your docker app. The problem there is you've got to distribute, you have to come up with your secure way to distribute those credentials to each device. And if they're the same, it's one thing. If they vary per device, it's more work. So that's, that's an area we're still kind of working through. And it, it's kind of, it's a tricky one. Um, we got to figure out how to make that an upstream friendly approach that everybody wants to manage that differently. And I don't have a great answer yet for, for that part. Oh. Yeah, it, it's funny. It's uh, and it's actually pinging it. Oh. So let's see. I'm not. Uh, I'll show you guys a a really handy command since we're sitting here with Actualizer. Their their logging is pretty good. You can put log level zero, and it's going to be a lot to do, but um, you get a little more info from it. Um, anyways, sorry, but what it would have looked like is I would list, and it would show you that there was a 606 and a 607. It's basically that targets file I was showing you guys earlier, but for it's running on here. And then you can, there's an update command, and there's two ways you can run the update command. Um, you can just run a raw update, and it finds the latest build and applies that. Or you can say, I want to update to this specific target. So it kind of gives you the freedom to do it either way. So like for our devices in the field, we just have them, you know, put me on the latest. But for like our CI devices where you're testing out different builds at different levels, we have our CI system say, you know, do actualizer light update to build 15 and reboot and test. Yeah, go ahead. Great question. Uh, so R slash Verisoda is not managed by OS tree, and we keep all the Docker stuff in there. And our Verlib Docker is also not managed within OS tree. Now, some people are kind of interested, or 
There are ways to produce OS tree images that have like Docker, like kind of uh, pre-populated for like your images and stuff. And it's something we're kind of looking at, but that's not our current approach. Well, so it's a great question. So Docker on, what, what we have with our Docker images, so Docker has something called Notary, which is actually tough. And if your Docker images, the, the key that you need to do with, with your Docker app, and this is up to you to, to do properly, but if you pin your app to a specific uh, version of a tag, then Docker Notary makes sure that you're putting the right thing down. So if you're tagging the version of what you're getting, then Tuff has told you this is the thing, and it's already tagged. So you do, you're getting what you expect. Um, so. <laughs> I'm probably the wrong guy since I've been pushing Actualizer Lite on this. But, I mean, Uptain, it, Uptain's the right solution for a lot of people. I mean, if I was putting this in a car, I would use Uptain probably. But um, it, with Uptain, people, it tends to, I think that if I was doing a more conservative thing where I didn't want all my devices being up to date, I'm just, we're kind of working in a place where we think keeping devices up to date all the time is the right way to be. So it fits our, our model well. But Uptain does that. Another thing that Uptain kind of gives you, and we're kind of working through some of this with uh, tooling. So what with Uptain, that device is kind of phoning home, and it's giving some information like, hey, this is all the things that are on my system. This is my IP. And you get some uh, what I'll call active data about the target. And with what we have now, it's, it, this is running in an anonymous, anonymous mode. So we don't have the active data. We do get what I'm kind of calling passive information. So um, for instance, in the HTTP client that's talking to the server, it includes like some headers like X, ATS, OS tree hash. And so, so we, we're getting that, just kind of a different, what I think is a lighter weight way to do it. Um, and the other thing with you know Uptain, like you see my uh, my file there, we have a mo we have a daemon mode. I haven't upstreamed that yet. It's in our uh, company's uh, fork of Actualizer. We have a just a daemon mode now that runs, and the polling interval is like once an hour for default. So if you roll out a change, you know you could wait 59 minutes before you're gonna see the update go to the device. Where in Uptain, you can just say do it now. Yeah, I think like that it's annoying for like CI, but we do our CI a little bit different. But in the field, that seems safe. So it's uh, that they, they use the same approach. What so Uptain is actually doing tough stuff, but it has online keys. Where tough, you're gonna the first thing you're going to do with Tuff is basically you kind of do this rotation. You make your you have an offline copy of the keys. Within Uptain, since it's talking to each device, when it pairs initially, they like create an agreed upon set of keys, but that sits live. And it you're getting into some. I won't go too far into that because I don't understand the Uptain part of the spec that well. But they, they do have safety around that to where it makes sense. Yeah. So um, I guess the piece that, that I'm always worried about in some of the communications that we've been exploring is when I need to be like playing with use groups and playing with those pieces, especially during like early stage of board bring up. Like what about You I don't think you'd want to do that for your board bring up stuff. I mean actually like 
Mike does our kernel work on the LMP at our company. I, I don't think you're like, you're just making, you're still, you're going to be having to DD and, you know, whatever. Are you talking about like, are you taking Well, it's just like, it's just like, I mean, you make that, that statement. That's why it's just like pushing away from that. I'm just, I'm more curious, like, thinking more generically about some of the, uh, the, like, the test side of this and, like, including testing different update situations and being able to read that back into known starting states. Um, like, whether you guys are doing stuff for that or were you just said. So, no, uh, we haven't gone that far with our CI yet, just from time constraints. But one of the things we've always had is we want to, in the future, like when we're testing a promotional candidate, we need to, like when CI kicks off on that hardware device, and we actually just run our CI agents directly on the hardware, it should say, OK, I, I need to move myself. If I'm not on the latest promoted build, I need to downgrade myself to that one reboot, then upgrade myself to what we want to test and go through that. But you can go up and down like that. With yeah, I think to get back to your question, you need more control to move the hardware and stuff compared to the most state of where you're going to move it, right? Uh, but what we are going to explore next is making sure there's a proper watchdog driver to do that with our testers. We really should have that so that we can trigger a rollback with when the watchdog triggers a reset and we can go through a lot of those successful moves that are Yeah. So you can be more conservative about, like, we, we let you write around to different things. And yeah, you could get your overlay messed up like that. But I think you can be more conservative and just prevent that to where it's you know, read only except for a certain, certain place. Yeah, well, I mean, any, any system that allows, con if you're going to have configuration of some form, it's got to be writable. So any, even with AB, you're gonna. If, if you have anywhere where you can customize it, you're gonna. If you ever have that poison config file, the, the good thing with that is, well, it's not. Uh, hopefully, rollback can help you. But you know, we we've actually talked about before, like, if someone wanted to, because now when if you ever had a device and you wanted to somehow switch to a different server, how would you do that? And you almost have to make like special updates that, you know, like if you knew you had a device that was malfunctioning, but it could update itself at least, you could almost make a specific update for it that overrode that file and kind of fixed you out of it and then kind of update from that. But it's, it's hard. Device management can be scary. Any other questions? All right, thanks, guys.